Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so I'm Simon Jupp, I'm a technical coordinator at the EBI uh, for the Samples, Phenotypes and Ontologies team. Um, so I, we can argue about what this title means later, but um, I need to stop this auto forwarding now. I don't know how to do Does anyone know how to do that? Because I always have this problem when I do PDF presentations. Anyway, let's hope. So, I will start by just giving some quick updates on the EBI RDF platform as we're in the RDF session. Um, so those that follow the, the progress and the work that we do on RDF at the EBI, um, I would say that in the last couple of years, the RDF platform has kind of slipped into a kind of maintenance mode. So you'll notice that we haven't added any new data sets um, and actually just updates in general to the Sparkle endpoint have become less frequent. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that our interest has moved away from RDF, it's just um, there hasn't been uh, as much of a drive as we would have hoped in sort of new RDF data sets coming out and pushing to make them available in the platform. Um, but all the individual resources that are generating RDF are continuing to do so, so if you want the latest version of Ensemble in RDF you can still get these things from the FTP. And we're trying to work out internally what's actually the most efficient way for us as an institute to make sure this data um, does eventually become available in um, one or more Sparkle endpoints, but um, there are sort of internal infrastructure concerns that we have to deal with actually to make this work uh, reliably and at scale. Um, but it's also, you know, as things change and there are some changing sort of shifts in paradigms that I'm noticing at EBI, so um, everyone's getting very excited about the word knowledge graph now and lots of databases are talking about are we making a knowledge graph. And again, just generally with sort of graph database technologies, you're seeing a shift that there are more resources um, looking to adopt things like Neo4j and these kind of other popular graph databases. And I see all of these things as being kind of positive steps that whilst groups may not be jumping initially to provide RDF and Sparkle, they're kind of moving in this direction of thinking about the data as a graph and thinking about uh, the connections between resources. So uh, I think that we can look at this as a positive. I would say that if you are, you know, keep calm. Um, this is not the end for Spark or anything at DBI, but it's um, we're, we're really on this kind of still on a learning phase on how we do this. And I'd really like to focus on really some of the other efforts around semantics and RDF that are actually happening at DBI and that, that we're driving. And I think a lot of this is being um, now held together through Elixir. So we're really starting to see Elixir. Uh, working in Europe, bringing communities together, bringing standards together, um, especially through the Elixir interoperability platform, um, which is more than just about, you know, let's turn everything into RDF and make Sparkle endpoints. It's really about identifying which of the resources uh, that we have in Europe that actually help us on this path to interoperability. So identifying the core resources, the core services um, that assist us in making our data more interoperable, um, better annotated, better use of ontologies, and, and how we kind of adopt this as a real, uh, as a, build this as a community. And this is really happening. Um, now one of the services that my team run is the ontology services at EBI. And again, we're seeing lots of sort of positive upward trends, so we're continuing year on year to see an increase in usage, an increase in interest in ontologies, which is good. Uh, we, it sort of amazes me that you, know, you regularly have around 6,000 users, individual users on the site every month, you know, accessing ontologies. Um, even more when we look at the API, API requests, you know, we can get up to sometimes 50 million hits in a month. So people are really using ontologies and there's obviously a lot of data annotation going on and people are trying to align to these common standards. So this is great. Um, OLS is a recommended Elixir interoperability resource now that brings us into that community of resources that um, Elixir are identifying and making sure that we're well connected with other interoperability resources like identifiers.org and fairsharing.org uh, and making sure that, you know, that there's general kind of discussion going on between these groups that we're all pulling in the same direction. Um, we're also part of the EOS which is the European Open Science Cloud and this is again seeing a shift of our services um, to sort of more cloud environments. So how do we um, make our services more cloud native so that we can run these services in different sort of geological, uh, geographical regions um, and maybe putting our services behind private networks, especially you know, inside companies. So we're sort of thinking in this direction as well. Um, one of the other services I wanted to call out is our ontology mapping service. 
Um, so this service is, um, provides you access to all the sort of curated ontology mappings that we can find. So we crawl mappings from different ontologies, from sort of curated mappings from different resources at the EBI, and provide an interface and an API for people to access uh, these mappings. We have over nearly two million mappings now uh, between the various ontologies, and there's definitely a focus on mapping between disease ontologies. There's a big interest there, especially given the, you know, the numerous disease ontologies that are available. Um, I'll point out that this was a service that I actually started in the 2017 hackathon, so this was kind of prototyped at the, by a hackathon in uh, 2017, and yeah, two years later now, this is a service at EBI, and this is a highly accessed service as well. Um, one of the things that I have been requested is having a Sparkle endpoint to these mappings, and that is something that could be a potential topic for this hackathon. So, going more generally about um, standardization efforts, so there's a whole bunch now, you know, very large international standardization efforts going on. Uh, these are just a handful of the ones that our team are in involved in, but I know that there are many more. So um, you've got the standardization that the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health are doing and within their metadata working group. Uh, we're involved in developing the metadata standards for the Human Cell Atlas. Um, we're also heavily involved now in the European Joint Programme on Rare Diseases, so we're trying to coordinate standards for uh, rare disease data. And kind of, I also see this as a related effort, which is the bioschemas effort. And I'm pretty sure someone later today will be talking more about bioschemas. But what I just want to kind of pull out really is that there's these kind of trends that you're seeing across these standards. So um, I've highlighted here that clearly JSON and JSON schema is actually getting uh, more widespread adopt adoption in these groups. And there's clearly some sort of work looking at, okay, well, how can we do the mapping to RDF and JSON LD? provides us a nice um, sort of path to RDF on top of these standards that are kind of predominantly JSON based. So what can we do and what kind of trends do we see that are emerging here? So I think it's fair to say that this kind of use of technologies like JSON Schema uh, and JSON LD, these strike a good balance, especially for software developers and uh, well, technically minded people who aren't semantic web uh, savvy or aren't necessarily interested in RDF and semantic web technologies. So I think it's our job now as a community to say, okay, well, if these are the technologies that people are sort of converging around, then how do we ensure that these standards that are being developed are kind of well-grounded in the ontologies that we develop, that we have in common uh, RDF, sort of semantic models underneath all of these. And um, in the, I think in 2017 hackathon, Thomas Liner, who's here again today from my team was working at looking at these models where you have sort of JSON schema, you have REST APIs driven by hyper, hypermedia. What, how can you get cheap RDF out of these resources? Uh, so we have pipelines for generating RDF from the BioSamples database. And also we looked at getting RDF data out of the GWAS catalog, um, where initially, internally, they hadn't really been thinking about RDF, but we found ways of applying JSON LD and things to get RDF out of their data. And also last year, at the RDF Summit, David Steinberg and myself worked on similar pipelines for streaming RDF out of the Human Cell Atlas uh, metadata by kind of applying JSON-LD to uh, a schema that was developed primarily as JSON schema. And I think that you sort of, um, you can see that this is possible, it's clearly possible, but not all JSON is kind of amenable to this kind of uh, transformation where you can simply just say, okay, I'll, I'll define the JSON LD context and I'll be able to get some meaningful RDF out of it. That's definitely not the case. So, really, uh, this is my final slide, and I just want to say that, you know, if it must be JSON, if communities must and want to converge around this, um, then we as a community can actually come up with guidelines and best practice for how you develop schemas in this way that are amenable. Uh, to sort of more straightforward RDF translations, so that they're, they're grounded in good RDF um, semantic models. And again, if it must be JSON schema, so if, they, if, if these communities want to use JSON schema, and there's perfectly good reasons for using this, then we can also think about how can we extend JSON schema with the kind of semantic constraints that we would want. So how do we express uh, that as particular fields should be um, aligned to a subset of ontologies and so on, and how do we define semantic types if we've just got JSON schema? And again, at the EU hackathon last year, 
we were developing JSON schema validators that were kind of a bit more semantically aware so that we could express ontology validations within JSON schema and validate these. So uh, I'll finish now. I think overall this week I'm interested in anyone else that is involved in developing these kind of standards and how we can um, converge and develop best practices for developing these kind of schemas. That's it. Thank you.